All right, this is section one of the exponents and radicals test review. So section one, properties of exponents. Uh, directions, simplify each expression as much as possible. Your answer should contain, or should only contain, positive exponents. Let's take a look at number one. So here we've got two squared times two to the third. So there, there are some tricks, some properties that you can use. Um, sometimes it's just easier to expand the expand stuff out though to see how it works. So two squared is the same thing as two times two. And we have two to the third is the same thing as two times two times two, right? Two times itself three times. And these are being multiplied together, right? So really, how many twos are being multiplied together? There's five of them. So it's really two to the fifth power, or if you actually multiply them together, two times two is four, times two is eight, times two is 16, times two is 32. So our final answer is two to the fifth or 32. Okay, so well, the trick here, the, pro the property is, hey, if, the, if two exponential expressions are being multiplied together, okay, and their bases are the same, you can add the exponents. So it's, yeah, two squared plus three, like the two plus three, that's the same thing as two to the fifth power. So that's the trick, but sometimes it's just nicer to expand them out. All right, question number two. Here we've got a whole bunch of stuff being multiplied. Remember, each of these are being multiplied individually. So like this three m squared, that's really three times m squared times n to the third, times two, times m squared, times n to the third, times three, times n. These are all being multiplied together. And it doesn't matter what order you multiply them in. So I wanna kind of group them together by common things, so like three, the two, and the three. I can multiply those together. Three times two is six, times three is 18. Okay, now here I've got m squared, which is really m times m. Here I've got m squared, which is also m times m. That's all of my m's, right? So they're being multiplied together. How many m's do I have? I have m to the fourth, which is similar to the uh, property we just talked about in the last problem. If they're being multiplied together, you can add their exponents. So here I have two, two plus two is four. The n's, I've got three of them multiplied to three more, multiplied to one more, right? So there's actually one right here, so three, plus three, plus that invisible one right there, makes seven. So it's n to the seventh power. Okay, question number three. This time we have two x to the third, y to the fourth, raised to the third power. That means I have two x cubed, y to the fourth, three times. So times two x to the third, y to the fourth, times two x to the third, y to the fourth. And now I can just multiply these together. Two times two times two is eight. X to the third times X to the third. So there's three of them, three more make six, three more make nine, so that's X to the ninth. Y to the fourth, four more makes eight, four more makes 12, X to the ninth, Y to the 12th. The trick, so that's our final answer. The trick is when you're raising a power to a power, you bring that exponent in and you multiply it to all of the exponents, including the invisible one on that two right there. So it's really two to the third power, which is eight, x to the three times three, which is nine, and y to the four times three, which is 12. And that's your final answer for number three. Okay, question number four. We've got two n on top of four n squared, or in the numerator and four n squared in the denominator. Uh, so we have four, n squared is the same thing as n times n. In fact, I'm gonna do a little bit of a tricky thing here. I'm gonna get rid of the four as well. Four is the same thing as two times two. Right, two times two. So now what we have here is we have a, uh, a let's start with the n's. I have an n on top and two of them on the bottom. But what is n divided by n? It's just equal to one. Something divided by itself is equal to one, so those cancel out. And that's why they cancel out, is because it's just, now it's turning into a times by one, which times and stuff by one doesn't matter. That's why we say they cancel out. They don't, I guess they do kind of cancel out, but they really turn into times by one. Same thing here, two over two, that's really just turning into another times by one. So what do I have left? I have one on the top, 
and I have a 2 on the bottom and an n on the bottom. So I have 1 over 2n, which makes sense because 2 over 4 simplifies to be 1 over 2, which I have right here. I have 1n on the top, 2 of them on the bottom, so that 1 on the top cancels out 1 on the bottom, leaving me with only 1 left on the bottom. All right, question number five. Yes, our first negative exponent. Here we go. So negative exponents, they don't make things negative. They just move things. That's all the negative exponents do. They move, okay? So this k to the negative 3 power, that negative 3 power only applies to the k. It does not apply to the 3. The 3 technically has a power of positive 1. If I wanted that negative 3 to apply to this 3 as well, this would have to be in parentheses. Now the negative 3 applies to the 3 and the k. But it's not in parentheses, so it doesn't. So what, this, what the negative exponent does is I can take the exponent and its base, which is k, and I can move it to the other side of the fraction. So right now, I don't really, I kind of have a fraction, I guess. It's, I can put it all over 1, right? Now it's a fraction. I can move that k to the negative 3 down to the denominator of that fraction. And by doing that, by moving it around, it changes the sign of the exponent. So now I have 3 up in the top and times 4k squared. Nothing has changed with those. But now in the bottom, not only do I have the 1 down here, but 1 is being multiplied to k, but now k is to the positive 3 because I moved it. Okay? I could, if I wanted to, I could move this k squared down to the bottom 2. I would just make it k to the negative 2. That's fine. It's not helpful, but I can do it. Right? Mathematically, that's an okay, that's an okay legit thing to do. Okay? So now I've got, let's clean this up a little bit, I've got 3 times 4 is 12, so I've got 12k squared divided by k to the third, all right? So I have two k's on top, three of them on the bottom, two of these are going to cancel out two of these, leaving me with a single k in the denominator. So I have 12 on the top and a single k in the denominator. Okay, question number six. Hey, look, there's another negative exponent. But before I deal with the negative exponent, I want to deal with this exponent on the outside of the parentheses first. So this is saying I have 2a to the negative 3b squared four times. Oh, and times a. We don't want to forget about him. So I have 2a to the negative 3b squared times 2a to the negative 3b squared times 2a to the negative 3b squared times 2a to the negative 3b squared, there's four of them, and then don't forget our little a, times a. All right, so now we've got 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 is 8, times 2 is 16. I have negative 3a's. Another negative 3 makes negative 6. Remember, I can just add these numbers together. That's a to the negative 6, a to the negative 9, a to the negative 12, and a to the first right here. So negative 12 plus 1 is a to the negative 11. And our b's, I got b2, b to the f 2 more is 4, b2 more is 6, and then 8. So b to the 8th. Okay, the shortcut would be taking that 4 up here and multiplying it to the exponents, right? So this would be 2 to the 4th power, which is 16. a to the negative 12 power times another a makes it a to the negative 11 power. And b to the... 8th power because of 2 times 4 is 8. So now my direct, so I'm almost done, but the directions do say I'm not supposed to have any negative exponents. So this a has a negative exponent. So what I can do is turn this into a fraction and I want to move, remember negative exponents move, this down to the denominator. So I have 16b to the 8th all over a to the positive 11. Okay, number seven. It looks scary, but it's really not going to be too bad. Okay, let's deal with this power of two. I like to deal with the stuff outside the parentheses first, like exponents outside the parentheses first. So let's deal with that first. So I've got this. Basically, I just write it twice if I wanted to. If you can remember the tricks for it, that's fine. But I'm just going to write it twice. That way I make sure I don't mess up. Uh, or I should say I'm less likely to mess up, I think. So I have two x to the negative 1, y to the negative 3, times x, y to the third. Times itself twice, right? So 2x to the negative 1, y to the negative 3, times x, y to the third. There we go. Now I dealt with that exponent right there. Oh, we can clean up the bottom a lot. I'm going to just keep the top the way it is. 2x to the fourth y. So on the bottom, I've got 2 times 2 is 4. I've got x to the negative 1 
times x to the 1, well, those are just going to cancel out. It's going to be x to the 0. Negative 1 plus 1 is 0. So that's x to the 0, which is uh, x to the anything to the 0 power is just equal to 1. So that's equal to 1. And here's another x to the negative 1, x. So that's also equal to 1. So I don't have any x's left on the bottom. They just go away. Y is though, let's see, I've got y to the negative 3, y to the third. Oh, wait a minute. Those go away too. y to the negative 3, y to the third, those also go away. Negative 3 plus 3 is 0. So I don't have anything left with zeros. Technically, I have x to the 0, y to the 0, right? But anything to the 0 power is just 1. So I have 2x to the fourth y over 4 times 1 times 1, which is 4. I can simplify the 2 and the 4 to make 1 over 2. So it's 1x to the fourth y over 4. Two. That's our final answer for seven. Okay, number eight. Let's get a look. Scary? Don't worry about it. Oh, look, I have a negative exponent. I want to worry about that first. So the first thing I want to do is I want to take this negative exponent and its base, which is this whole thing, and I want to move it all up to the other side of the fraction. So I'm going to move it up here. So I already have an AC times CB to the negative three times 2A to the fourth b to the third, and now times by parentheses, everything in here, the exponents stay the same. 2 positive a squared b to a negative 3. The only thing that's going to change because I'm moving it is the exponent on the outside. It's going to change to a positive 4. Okay, from here, you got some options. You can kind of clean this garbage up a little bit, or you can take care of this. Um, I think I'm going to clean up this stuff first. Uh, now let's take care of this first. So I have this a c times c b to the negative three times two a to the fourth b cube. Nothing's changed there. Times I could write this out four times, but by now I'm getting a little bit more savvy on how this works, right? So I know this is two to the first power, and the trick is take this four and it multiplies to all the exponents. So it's really two to the fourth power times a to the eighth power times b to the negative 12th power. And you would get the same thing if you wrote this out four times and simplified and brought everything together. Now let's clean things up. I have two to the fourth power, which is two times two times two times two, which is 16, times two is 32. Let's look at all my a's. I got a to the first, a to the fourth, so that's gonna be eight, that's five a's. Uh, eight more makes 13. So a to the 13th, let's look at our b's b to the negative 3, b to the positive 3, so those are going to cancel out. Negative 3 plus 3 is 0, and I have b to the negative 12, okay, and c. c times c, that's it, right? Just those two, so c times c is c squared. So now the only thing I have left to do is change this negative exponent, so I can move this b to the negative 12 down to the denominator, and I have 32a to the 13th c squared, all divided by moving this down to the bottom is B to the positive 12 power. And there's my answer to number eight. All right, let's take a look at section number two. This is just rewriting different formats. So like if I have, uh, let's say I have a radical of, let's color code this thing, A under here, and then the exponent, or not the exponent, the index, that's what we call this number here, is B and then it's all being raised, everything's being raised to a power of c, okay? I can rewrite it using rational exponents, is what they're called, fraction exponents, and I can write it like this. It's gonna be, the base is still a, but now it's raised to a fraction with c on top and b in the denominator, like that. So these two statements are exactly the same thing. They mean exactly the same thing. And what we're doing on these five problems is rewriting them. 9 and 10, we're going from this to this. And 11 through 13, we're rewriting it from these exponents, fraction, rational exponents to radical form. Okay, so number 9 looks like our little index number, there isn't one. So by default, it's a 2, right? By default, it's a 2. And our A value, or our base is 5. And the number on the outside is 3. So when I rewrite this, I'm going to get... 5, our base, raised to the c over b, so 3 over 2 power, 5 to the 3 halves power. And that's it. That's all I have to do on that problem. This and this, they mean exactly the same thing. Okay, on 10, 17 is our base. 
the whole thing is being raised to the power of 1, right? Because there's nothing there. So when I rewrite this, it's going to be 1 over 5. 17 to the 1 fifth power. Okay, 11. 8 to the 1 fourth power. So 4 is my index. So I'm going to have my radical sign. 8 goes underneath. The little 4 goes right here. And then I'm done. That's it. If you want to put raised to a power of 1, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but you could have just left it as fourth root of eight. Notice we're not simplifying any of these. We're just rewriting them. Okay, so this one is going to be 10, okay, with the little two right here. So that's a square root. If you put the little two, I don't think it's a problem. Uh, and then raised to a power of seven. This one has a negative exponent, and it does say we should only include positive exponents. So let's take care of the negative exponent first. So let's treat this like a fraction, and we're going to move this down to the denominator. That makes it, so it's going to move it down to the bottom, so 52 to the positive 3 fourths. I do need to keep something up top. Technically, this whole thing is being multiplied by 1, right? I can just multiply by 1. It doesn't do anything. So technically, the top still has a 1 in the top. Okay, now we can rewrite it. So I have 1 over radical. I have a fourth root of 52, and the whole thing is being raised to the third power like so. And that's our answer to number 13. All right, section three, simplifying radical expressions. So directions say simplify each expression and decimal answers are not permitted. And the reason why we say that is we don't want you just trying to type this into a calculator. We want you to do simplify them by hand. So let's look at 14. We're doing the cubic root of 512. So to simplify this, we're going to break 512 down into its factors or the smaller pieces that multiply together to get 512. So we're going to take 512, and we're going to come up with two numbers, any two numbers that multiply together to equal 512. Well, it does end in a 2, so I know it's even, so it is divisible by 2. So I'm going to divide it by 2 first. So 2 and 512 divided by 2 is 256. Now the 2, I can't really break up anymore. I mean, I could just keep breaking up into 2 and 1 and 2 and 1 and 2 and forever and ever, but it's not quite what we want to do. We want to leave it at, uh, once we get down to prime numbers, that's as far as we want to break it down. So 2 is done. 256, though, we can still break that one down. 256, uh, it is even, so it is divisible by 2, but just for fun, let's divide it by something else. Let's do uh, divided by 8. I think it's divisible by 8. Sure is. 8 and 32. Or I could have done 2 and 128. It wouldn't matter in the end. You get the same answer either way. 8, I can break that one up even further. So I've got, what, 2 times 4? And 4 can be broken up to 2 times 2. Uh, 32 is 2 and 16. 16 is 8 and 2. And 8 is 2 and 4. And 4 is 2 and 2. Okay, so as I look at all this, this tree mess that I have right here, Anything that got cross, that got broken down, I don't care about anymore. So I'm going to put a little red line through these. So 512, I don't care about anymore. 256, I don't care about anymore. 8, 32, 4, 16, 8, and 4. All those numbers I don't care about anymore. All I care about are these twos right here. Okay? So technically, mathematically, what we're doing here, I'm going to do like, the, this is going to be the long way, not only do it for this problem, I'm going to do the long way right here and then the kind of short way over here. What we have here is we have the cubic root of the following. Cubic root of 2 times 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 2. If I multiply all those 2's back together again, I get 512. So there's what, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 of them? 2 times 2 times 2, 3, 6, and nine of them, right? That's nine twos. All get multiplied back together to get 512. Now what I can do with those twos, remember this is the long way of doing things, but I feel like it, it's a better explanation of what's actually happening, is I can rewrite these. So two times two times two, and, and really two to the ninth, right? But I don't want to go all the way to the ninth. I want to max out at this number. So these three I can combine together and write it as two to the third power. These three, I can also, two times two times two is 2 to the third power. And these three also, 2 to the third power. And they're all being multiplied together, right? Okay, one of the properties of radicals is that if on the inside of the radical, all I have is multiplication or division, I can actually break these up into separate radicals. So I, this is really the cubic root of 2 cubed times the cubic root 
of 2 cubed again, that middle 2 cubed, times the cubic root of 2 cubed again. And so we can break this up to that. Now why we want to do that, you might ask? Well, look, I have 2 cubed, and I take the cube root of it. The cubic root and the cubed cancel each other out, again, out, of, out, cancel each other out. so I'm left with just the number 2. In fact, 2 to the third power is 8, and the cubic root of 8, what number times itself 3 times is equal to 8? The answer is 2. So cubic root of 2 cubed is just 2. Cubic root of 2 cubed is also 2. In fact, what I want to do with these numbers, I'm going to draw them in different colors. I'm going to do this 2 in purple. I'm going to do this 2 in green. And this one, lo and behold, it is also, cubic root of 2 cubed is 2. And so I can multiply all those together, 2 times 2 times 2, and my final answer is 8. So that is the answer to problem number 14. But that's the long way of thinking about it, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But there is a shorter way once I've gotten this all down. Okay. So what I'm looking for, so, I'm, so that's the answer. That's doing it the long way, the kind of more like mathematical, here's why it works. Let's come over here and kind of show you the, the shorthand way of doing it. So I've broken everything down. I'm only looking at the twos. And what I'm looking for are any items in my list down here that appear three times. And I'm going to circle them. So, for example, two appears a whole bunch of times. So I'm going to circle three of them. So it doesn't matter which three. I'm just going to circle three of the twos. So there's three of the twos right there, right? Uh, look, I've got three more twos. So I'm going to circle three of those twos as well. And there's another group of twos right there. And you'll notice I use those same colors over here because what's going to happen is because I have this triplet right here, these three twos, uh, I can bring the number two outside of the radical. So I'm going to draw the little radical here, the cubic root of stuff, right? I can bring these three twos outside the radical and write the number two to represent that group. So I'm going to write a single two to represent that group. I can do the same thing with this one. They can also escape the radical, and I can write the number two to represent that group. And here, I'm going to write the number two to represent that group of twos. And there is nothing, once I take that out, everything else inside this here has either been crossed off because we broke it down, or has been circled and thus has escaped the cubic root symbol. So I really actually don't need this cubic root anymore. If there was stuff left over, which there will be on some other problems, I would actually write them inside the cubic root, but there's not here. So I don't actually need that. And my answer is simply just 2 times 2 times 2, which is 8. Same thing we got on over here doing it the long way. Okay, so let's try number 15. 15 is a little bit different. You'll notice that there is not a number up here. It's a square root. So this time, instead of looking for groups of three, we're looking for things that appear twice. Also, there is a negative inside of this radical. And it's actually that negative I want to deal with first. So once again, kind of the long way of thinking about this is I have the square root of technically negative 1 times 81 which I can then break up to be the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 81. Okay, We're going to come back to the square root of negative 1 in a second. Let's focus on the square root of 81. This one, square root of 81, you actually might know without doing any work. But if you need to do the work, that's fine. So we're going to break 81 down. Looking for two things that multiply together to 81. So 3 and 27 would work. 27 can be broken down to be 3 and 9. And 9 can be broken down to be... 3 and 3. And what I'm looking for are things that appear twice, because technically the square root, there's technically a little 2 right here. So I'm looking for things that appear twice. Oh, look, I have a pair of 3s right there, and I have another pair of 3s. And that's everything. Everything else got broken down, right? The 81 I don't care about. The 27 and the 9 both got broken down, so we don't care about it. That's everything. So the square root of 81 is simply the number 3 to represent that group and another number 3 to represent that group, and I multiply them together, which is 9. So the square root of 81 is 9. Now, so that's that part right there. This one right here, the square root of negative 1, this was something new that we learned this year. The square root of negative 1 is actually an imaginary number. Uh, it doesn't mean it's a fake number, it's just we call them imaginary numbers, because if you think about it, and the normal numbers that we think of, uh, to answer this, what is the square root of negative 1, don't work. Like positive 1 won't work. Positive 1 times positive 1 is positive 1. So the square root of negative 1 can't be positive 1. It also can't be negative 1 because negative 1 times negative 1, also positive 1. So 
This is what we call an imaginary number, and what we're going to put for it is the letter I. Do this in actually a different color. Let's do light blue. And do the color, a letter number I, or letter I. Now, I like to put a little curly on the bottom. You don't have to do that, but they're usually, it's a lowercase i. Okay, so really, we have i times 9, so our final answer is 9i. It's an imaginary number, 9i. Okay, and that's our answer to number 15. Let's take a look at 16. Once again, we are dealing with a square root, so technically there's a little 2 right here. This time, the negative, there's something out in front, the negative's out in front, so which means that anything that uh, we will uh, be pulling out is going to get multiplied to that negative right there. So let's try it. We're going to break down the 288. So I need two things that multiply to 288. Well, that's going to be 2 and, because it's divisible by 2, so I know, ooh, 144. Okay, 144, you know what? I remember that from uh, elementary school. I remember that that is 12 times 12. So I'm going to break it up to B. 12 and 12. Then I can break each of those up to 12 is about 3 and 4. And 4 is 2 and 2. That's uh, so right here. We got 3 and 4 again. 4 is 2 and 2. Ooh, and this time I have some X's on here too which actually isn't too bad. I'm just going to write out three X's. X cubed is the same thing as X times X times X. Okay, so now with the rest of this, let's see, we broke up the 288, so we don't care about it anymore. The 144, the 212s, the two fours. All we have left are a bunch of twos and a couple of threes. Okay, so now what we're going to do, I'm going to draw my square root sign. Okay. I already have a negative out front, so I want to make sure I put that out here. Now, let's see what we have for pairs. I'm looking for things that appear twice. Okay, I've got well, here's a, I've got a bunch of twos. These two are right next to each other. I'm just going to circle those two. There's a group of twos. Okay, I've got another group of twos right here. I've got a group of threes right here. They're away from each other, but that's okay. It doesn't matter. They don't have to be next to each other. I put circled these twos because it was easier to circle. I could have circled those twos. At the front. And then I have a two left over. Okay, so that's important. I'm going to kind of just, uh, I'm going to, let's see, let's do it in, a, I guess I can box it or underline it in yellow. That's important. I don't want to forget about him, but it doesn't have a buddy. Okay, so I circled, oh, and then I've got my X's over here, huh? So I've got two X's. And once again, I have what, an X left over. Okay, so the things that get circled come out. So I have a pair of threes, so the number three comes out. I have a pair of twos, so the number two comes out. I have another pair of twos, so the number two comes out, and I did not give myself enough room, so let me get rid of that square root sign and put it right here. There we go. And I also circled a pair of X's, so the letter X comes out. And then the things that are left over stay on the inside, so I have a two left over. Ugh, I don't wanna use yellow. I highlighted it with uh, yellow, but I can't read that. We'll just use blue. The number two got left over, and an X got left over. And there's our answer. We're going to multiply those together, though. So 3 times 2 times 2. So a ne technically, this was a negative 1. Negative 1 times 3 is negative 3. Times 2 is negative 6. Times 2 is negative 12. So we have negative 12X times the square root of 2X. And that's our final answer. Okay, problem number 17. We're going to break down 180. We'll do this one kind of quickly. So we got 18 and 10, that will work. Uh, 18 is two and nine, nine is three and three, 10 is two and five, and that's everything, right? So the things we broke down, the 180, the 18, the 10, and the nine, I don't care about anymore. Uh, what we got, we're looking for pairs again. This is a square root, so we're looking for pairs. I've got a pair of threes, and I've got a pair of twos, and then I've got that five left over, right? So I'm gonna draw my square root sign. Things that got circled come out, so I have a pair of twos, two comes out, pair of threes, three comes out, and a five left over, so the five stays on the inside. That two and the three get multiplied back together again, so I have two times three, which is six, square roots of five as my final answer to this one. Okay, last two, 18 and 19. 
This time we are looking for things that come in fours. So let's break up the 96. So 96 is divisible by two, it's two and 48. 48 we can do what, four uh, and 12, right? And let me show you a little sneaky trick. I'm gonna leave the four alone for just a second. I'm gonna break the 12 up because it can be four and three. And I could, if I wanted to, I could break the fours to be two and two, but, oh, actually, no, I do have to because I'm, I'm doing fours. Anyways, if I had four fours, I could have stopped right there. I don't have, actually have to break them up. I was thinking this was a square root, in which case I could have just circled those. But I'm looking for things in fours, so I do have to go a little bit further. So two and two and two and two. Okay, so, and then I, what do we got for x? I've got a single x. I got seven y's, three, four, five, six, seven, six z's. One, two, three three, four, five, six. Okay, so I'm gonna draw my square. I've already got a five outside. I have my radical sign. Let me move it way over here. So I have plenty of room. And I have to remember to put the little four right there because this is still a fourth root, not a square root. And I'm looking for things that appear four times. Once again, I don't care about the things I broke down. 96, 48, the two fours and the 12. I don't care about those. So is there anything that appears four times? Uh, I've got a bunch of twos. In fact, I got five of them, right? So I got five twos. Um, I've got a, a two left over and a three left over. So the that is that four twos? Yeah, four twos. I got yeah four of the twos. So I can bring out the twos and they come out as a group of one, a single two. I have a two left over, so it stays inside. I have a three left over and it stays inside. Those are going to get multiplied back together again, and this two is going to get multiplied to the five. Uh, let's see, look at the variables. I don't have enough X's, so that X is the leftover, so it's going to stay inside. I do have a group of four, uh, four Y's right there, so one set of Y's comes out, and I've got one, two, three leftovers. So they stay on the inside. I'm going to write it as Y to the third power. That's Y times itself three times. And Z's, I've got four Z's right there with two leftover. So a group of Z's come out. And there's two left over, so I'm going to put z squared. So our final answer is 5 times 2, which is 10. y, z, fourth root of 2 times 3, which is 6, x, y, cubed, z, squared. And there's our answer to 18. Okay, 19. Once again, we have a negative insight, so I'm going to break this up to say the fifth root of negative one times 192x to the sixth, y to the tenth. And then I can rewrite that as the fifth root of negative one times the fifth root of 192x to the sixth, y to the tenth, okay? So I did that for a reason, because I want to deal with this negative separately. So in fact, we'll deal with it right now. Earlier, we had a negative like that, but it was under a square root. And we said that was an imaginary solution, right? This one is under a fifth root. So what number times itself five times is equal to negative one? Is that an actual normal number or is it an imaginary number? As it turns out, uh, the fifth root of negative one is a normal number. It's actually negative one. Negative one times itself five times. So negative one times negative one, positive one, times another negative one, that's three times, this is negative one, times negative one again, which is four times, that's back to being positive one, times negative one again for the fifth and last time, multiplies back to negative one. So the fifth root of negative one is negative one. Moral of the story is this, if the it's an odd index, like three, five, seven, nine, 11, whatever, then that root of a negative number or negative one is negative one. So really up here, we could have just brought this negative out side because it's going to come out and become a negative one. Now we have all this other garbage to worry about. This fifth root of 192 x to the sixth y to the tenth. So let's break up the 192. 192 it ends in 2 so it is divisible by 2. 192 divided by 2 is 96. Oh we broke up 96 earlier right over here. So 96 is 2 and 48, 48 is, let's do uh, 4 and 12, 4 is 2 and 2, 12 is 3 and 4, 4 is 2 and 2. And I'm too lazy to write out all those letters, but we'll figure it out in a second. 
I want, don't want to worry about the ones that got broken up, so I want to cross those off so I don't accidentally count them again. And we're looking for groups of five, so things that appear five times. And I've got a bunch of twos. In fact, I've got six of them, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. So I'm going to circle five of those. There's five of them right there. We have a three left over, and I have a two left over. So when I write my radical, this is a fifth root, right? Fifth root. I already have a negative one on the outside. We took care of that earlier. I'm bringing out the number two to represent this group of five twos. There's a two left over and a three left over. They stay on the inside. Okay, let's think through this. I would have drawn out, if I wasn't lazy, I would have drawn out six X's, which means five of them would have been circled. So I would have brought out a group of five of them. That X represents that five, but there would be one left over. So it's going to stay on the inside. With the uh, Y to the 10th, I would draw out 10 Y's. That makes two complete groups of five Y's and with none left over. So I actually can bring out two Y's and I'm going to write it as Y squared, Y times Y. And there's no Y's left over because it was a perfect group, right? So my final answer to this problem is negative 2XY squared fifth root of 6X. That is our final answer. All right, section four, simplifying rational exponent expressions. Directions simplify each expression as much as possible. So you notice on these problems, we have uh, rational exponents, so fractions as exponents, which is just fine. One thing that's really nice to remember is that we can always go from rational exponents to radical form. That's the one with the little square root sign. For example, if I have, let's take, uh, let's take this, let's do a radical f symbol like this, and let's say we have an A value in here, and a B value, and here's the index, and then that's all being raised to the power of C, right? So we have something like that, okay? That is exactly the same thing as taking that A value and raising it to a fraction power with your B on the bottom, so B in the denominator, your index, right? And your C on the top. Okay, a couple things to keep in mind. If there is no C out here, then C is one. If there is no B right here, then B is two for a square root. So you can solve these without changing over this form, but some people find it a little bit easier. So that's what I'm gonna do on these problems. I'm gonna switch it over first. So 16 to the one half power is going to be the same thing as, let me draw my radical sign, 16 underneath. Uh, the little two goes right here, and you can draw it if you want, but that just means it's a square root, okay? And then all raised to the power of one. And then I wanna simplify that. So this is just asking, hey, what's the square root of 16? And I know that one, I know what the square root of 16 is. It's four. And if you didn't know that, you could you know, do the little breakdown stuff that we did on the other section, and you would end up getting four. And then four to the first power is four. So there's our answer to number 20. Number 21, let's do the same thing. Let's do our little radical sign. Let's do 32, uh, well, five goes right here, and all raised to the power of three. Now this is another one, like square root of 16, uh, I would assume you probably have that one memorized. This would be another really good one to memorize. I'm still gonna uh, simplify it out using the, you know, making a factor tree, but it would be a really good one to just have memorized. So 32, we can break that up to be what, two and 16. Uh, 16 can be uh, four and four. Uh, four is two and two, and then two and two. And look at that, we've got five twos, and that's it. So the fifth root of 32 is two. So we've got two as that fifth root of 32, and it's being raised to the third power. Two to the third power is two times two, which is four, times two, which is eight. All right, 22, 27 to the negative four thirds power. You know what I'm gonna do on this one first though, before I change it to radical form, I wanna get rid of that negative exponent. So right now we have 27 to the negative four thirds. I wanna make that positive four thirds. So remember negative exponents just move, can move things. That's all it is. So I'm gonna turn this into a fraction. We can take that exponent and its base and we can move it to the other side of the fraction and change the sign of the exponent. So I can move this whole thing down here to the bottom of the fraction now. Keep in mind, this is like being multiplied by one up here, right? You can just multiply by one. That doesn't change anything, right? So when I move it, there's still a one left up top. So it's one over 27 to the now positive 
4 over 3. Okay. Now let's rewrite it using radicals. So that took care of the um, negative exponent. I still have 1 on top, but now my radical's in the bottom. We've got 27, uh, a little 3 right here, and raised to the fourth power. And look at this. Here's another one you probably should have memorized, uh, but we'll still break it down. So 27, we're looking for things that appear three times. So 27 is 3 times 9. 9 is 3 times 3. So look at that. We have uh, three threes. So we've got 1 over 3 to the fourth power. So 3 times 3 is 9, times 3 is 27, times 3 is 81. 1 over 81 is our solution to that problem. Okay, 23, uh, negative 125 to the 1 third power. So I'm going to rewrite that using radicals. So we got 120, oops, sorry, negative 125. Uh, to the one-third power. So that's a little three right here, and technically a power of one right here, but the power of one doesn't do anything, right? You're just raising it to a power of one. All right, so I have the cubic root of a negative. Now, uh, because it's an odd number, and we talked about these on uh, earlier problems, because this is an odd number, the negative can just come out. It's not an imaginary number. If it was an even uh, index, it would be an imaginary number, but the negative could just come out. So this is really negative cubic root of 125. Once again, this might be one that you might want to memorize, but it's, it's okay if you don't. Uh, see, it's, it doesn't end in an even number, so it's not divisible by 2, but it does end in 5, which means it is divisible by 5. So 5 and 25, and 25 can be broken up to be 5 and 5. And look at that. We have a group of three fives. So our final answer is negative 5. Okay, section five, powers of I. Directions simplify each expression as much as possible. Okay, so a little background with this problem. Uh, I'm gonna come down here, let's do this. Let, what is I to the zero power? Well, anything to the zero power we know is one, right? Okay, I to the first power. Well, anything to the first power is just itself, so that's I. Here's the tricky one, I squared. Well, we know i is equal to the square root of negative 1. So if I square both of these sides to get i squared, the square root and the square cancel each other out, and i squared is equal to negative 1. That's a tricky one to remember. And then i to the third power, well, that's just i squared times i, right? That would give me i to the third power. So it's i times a negative 1, which is negative i. And look, I need to do 17th power and 132nd power, which seems really daunting at first. But watch what happens when we do i to the fourth. i to the fourth power, okay? So that's i times i times i times i. And we already decided that i times i, i squared, right? these two multiplied together, is negative 1. Well, these two multiplied together are negative 1 as well. So what's negative 1 times negative 1? It's a positive 1 i to the fifth is simply that answer times i, right? i to the fourth times i. So it's one times i, which is i. And if you start to see a pattern, these are both ones, these are both i's. i to the sixth power is also equal to negative one. i to the seventh power is also equal to negative i. In fact, that pattern repeats. If I come down here, i to the eighth power is one. i to the ninth power is i. i to the tenth power is negative one. And i to the eleventh power is negative i. So the pattern is going to repeat every four numbers, right? So there's a couple ways of looking at this and like trying to decipher the pattern. Here's how I like to do it. I like to go back to third grade and I like to think about division in third grade. Remember division in third grade, how nice it was. It was so easy. For example, let's, let's take one of these, like nine, for example. Let's say I take nine. And if you remember dividing in, in, dividing in third grade, we'd use this fun little symbol like this. Remember that one? And I'm dividing it by four, okay? So how many times is four going to nine? Honestly, I don't care, really. I know it's two, but I don't really care. What I do care about, though, remember when we did those remainder stuff? We do a two remainder and then what's left over? So four goes into nine twice, right? But how many is left over? There's one left over, right? And that's the important thing, is what the remainder is when you divide it by four. So for example, if I did, let's do uh, 11. Uh, if I take 11 and divide it by four, 4 goes into 11, what, twice as well? Uh, but then there's 3 left over, 
right? It's got a remainder of 3. And you'll notice that the remainder here matches this number right here. So 9 right here, 1 would have a remainder of 1 if I divided it by 4. So would 5. So would 9. So would 13. So would 17, right? All of these. So if I divide the exponent by 4 and only look at the remainder, that's all I care. I don't care how many times 4 goes into the number. But just look at the remainder, it's going to be in this column right here. So this column right here is when I divide by 4 and I get a remainder of 1, that's this column. Uh, we did 11, right? It was a remainder of 3. So same thing, 3 divided by 4, right? 4 doesn't even go into 3, right? It goes in 0 times with a remainder of 3. 4 goes into 7 once with a remainder of 3. 4 goes into 11, we decided what, twice, with a remainder of 3. So these are all the remainders of 3 when I divide by 4. These ones right here, 6 divided by 4. I don't care how many times 4 goes into 6. What I care about is the remainder, which is going to be 2. And over here, 4 goes into these evenly. So my remainder is 0. So what I can do, my little shortcut for these two problems up here, is I just have to divide these by 4 and figure out what the remainder is. So let's do 17. Let's think, uh, this, my first question that I would ask myself is, hey, is 17 divisible by 4? No, it's not, right? But is there a number close to 17 that's divisible by 4? Yeah, 16 is, right? 16 is divisible by 4. So 16 would be a remainder of 0. 16 would be in this column, which means i to the 17th would be in this column. When I divide 17 by 4, I get a remainder of 1. So my answer here is i. 25. Might sound difficult because it's a big number, but if you just recognize that 100, 4 divides evenly into 100. Uh, so I actually only have to worry about the, the tens in the, in the units place, these two numbers right here, 32, because I know 4 goes into 100. So really the question is, does it go into 32 or not? and what the remainder is of that number if it doesn't, right? Four does, though, go into 32. It goes into it eight times evenly, right? So um, four does go into 132 evenly, so it's got a remainder of zero. So it's gonna be end up being in this column. So my answer to this one is positive one. Okay, there we go. And so you can do any of these you want. Just take the last two numbers, basically, and divide by four, and what your remainder is is which column it's going to be in, whether it's going to be remainder of 0 and your answer is 1, remainder of 1 and your answer is i, remainder of 2 and your answer is negative 1, remainder of 3 and your answer is negative i.